So I'm going to um, introduce our first keynote. Um, and I want to pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> so we have with us uh, Lamis Juma, who is uh, assistant professor in community nutrition at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. And she's also affiliate assistant professor at uh, Penn State in the US. Um, and she will talk to us about food and nutrition security of refugees and host communities at the intersection of sustainability and internationalization. So welcome, Lamis. Thank you. I'll make sure technology is working. Good afternoon, everyone. I think this is perfect. Great. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking you, Nathalie, thanking the organizing committee. Uh, thank you to Cecilia, to Alex, to Peter. Hope I'm not missing anyone for putting such a great uh, program. But also thank you for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. If you see me having this, it's because I need to walk. And the reason I need to walk is, one, my fitness tracker is saying I'm not doing a lot of exercise. Which I'm sure all of us can agree when we are sitting in our offices. But the other thing is I actually flew on Monday from the US with two little ones. And I'm jet lagged because I just hopped down on another airplane to come to Sweden, and I'm very excited to be here. It's actually my first time in Sweden, so thank you for welcoming me. I'm going to start with looking like this. Great. So let's get started. As a good academician, I'm used to starting with this slide. And just as I thought that that first slide should be a breeze, I reflected on it and I thought, maybe in this particular situation, it's actually not true. I actually do have to disclose something. And what I need to disclose is that I do have my own experiences that have shaped a lot of what I, whether through my education or research or actual live experience, uh, that shaped my views, my opinions and convictions, and actually shape the kind of research that I do. So maybe that's the first disclosure. I want to start with the journey. The journey of a displaced person, a migrant, may I call it a traveler. I'm actually going to call it my journey, because it is. And at the risk of saying my age, the journey started on September 19, 1982. Um, I was born in Lebanon, a small country in the Middle East. Um, and I was told that I was actually late by about a week from the date of my birth. So I was actually given a chance of life by the doctors. The reason why I was late for birth is because my parents were trying to keep me, their unborn child, and my older brother in an underground shelter because there was the Israeli invasion to the country at the time. I'm going to be emotional a little bit about this, but I'll keep it to myself. What really threw me off, though, is that, not that, is the fact that actually the day I was born was actually the end of a huge massacre that I learned about when I was a teenager called Sabra and Shatila massacre. And it happened in the suburbs of Beirut. This is my country, and this is where. And it was told that this was one of the largest massacres that happened in my country because they killed thousands of Palestinian refugees in their own homes. And this was part of the Lebanese Civil War. Of course, many casualties happen in between. But my parents told me I was very fortunate that I didn't live the peak of the Lebanese Civil War. And I tend to agree to that, except what I don't agree with is I actually have a lot of my own fears and anxieties that I keep reliving, because I did go through what a refugee lives through. Not only did I was able to uh, be lucky enough to leave the country when I was six years old to go to a very booming country in the Gulf, it hit me back home, if I kind of pass through the years a little faster, in 2006, when I was a teenager. So I came back to the country, and I actually lived through the 1996 war and the 2006 war. But the 2006 war left a mark for me, because I just got the, what I thought is a dream opportunity, and I still think it is, it's a dream opportunity to go to the U.S. and pursue my graduate studies. Literally the day, it was my last day for being a research assistant at the American University um, of Beirut Medical Center. I was celebrating the end of a chapter of my life, excited you know, to go to the U.S. and experience it all. That same evening, when I was planning all the fun and all the trips and all the challenges that may come, I was awakened past midnight by what I thought was a weird thunderstorm in the middle of the summer. Lebanese summer never have thunderstorms. But it was actually missiles hitting the Lebanese International Airport. So a week from that, I decided, you know what? I've learned from my parents and I've learned from Lebanese generations that giving up is not an option. Even though there's not an airport, and by the way, this is our only airport, I'm actually going to go on a very risky journey 
to Damascus and under the, a lot of the bombing that was going on because I was going to give myself and my parents the future and I thought education is the future. So they trusted in me and they actually believed that I can do it and we did it. But I was a lucky refugee then because what I didn't know is I was actually going to be welcomed to one of the best Syrian host families. They didn't know me. It's just an extended family member calling and saying, can you host her? And I had to find a booking and I was on an airplane. What a beautiful journey for a, for a refugee to be on an airplane to the US, to be hosted by the most welcoming Fulbright family and to have the best experience in my life there. My story is not unique. I'm sharing it because I actually thought, and it actually took a while, it took years, for me to realize that my story is not about me, it's about the destiny of relaying the message of many, many of those thousands and millions of refugees that I'm going to be talking about today briefly who don't have a chance to say their story, who don't have a chance to actually have their voice heard. So I want to make sure that their voice is heard and are respected and loved the way you are respecting and loving me. So this is where we start thinking about what's going on in our news. This is no new news, but I have to remind myself and remind ourselves that when we talk about refugees, we look at them in stats and in numbers, and I want to start with a story. This is a story of Aylan Kurdi, who many of us have seen, and it kind of brought the Syrian crisis back on the front face after years of going through that war, that kids and their families are trying to flee their country, but they're not given a chance. He was trying to flee Syria to go to Europe and on a boat on a very risky journey. And we also can't forget the face of Omar Daknish, who was actually looking at us with the face of war, the face of terror that he went through, hoping that somebody will hear his voice and those of his families. And this is in Aleppo. Fast forward this summer, while I was having a good time in the US with my family, I realized that the news keep getting, and even though I work with this, I keep struggling with the emotions and with also the, the human role that we should have. When I see the news from Tunisia, many of those refugees that are trying to flee from Libya to Europe couldn't make it. Actually, out of the 85 that were on that boat, 82 could not make it. Also along the same lines, Yemen, the forgotten war, as some people call it, we look at pictures and we kind of got used to it, unfortunately, and kind of muted this news because it's sad. This is a baby suffering from hunger and malnutrition due to a war and a blockade that has been going on for years now. The news headlines is not just happening in the Middle East, though, right? We've also seen this new picture. I think many of you are very familiar with this because this is actually happening in the summer. And everyone, when they saw this very um, emotional and very, if you want, powerful image, it told us the story again of Aylan Kurdi, except it's happening in another place. We're such a connected world. This is a family who's trying to flee the conflicts and the lack of hope and poverty that is happening in Central America for a better place. And they were found in Rio Grande because they couldn't cross the borders. The girl's right arm rests across the back of her father's neck. So powerful. It actually reminds us that this is the grim reality of the border um, restrictions amid this growing desperation of migrants trying to flee poverty and try to provide themselves and their kids a better chance. But we do have some hopeful images, right? We also, along the same summer headlines, we've been seeing, and of course many humanitarian organizations are working actively on this and internationally, but we have Richard Gere here trying to also bring forward the message that, you know what, I'm going to cut my trip and he had a summer uh, nice vacation, actually, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And he went and tried to meet some of the migrants that were being um, uh, you know, unable to actually reach the, the borders. He was working with an NGO from uh, Spain, and they were distributing food and bringing back the conversation that we can do something. In the news headlines, we also hear a lot the politics behind it, of course. And I know this is a huge debate that's happening in the EU. It's also happening in Lebanon and in the Middle East. We've got almost the two, if I lack of better terms, the extremes. We have Italy's Salvini blocking his own Coast Guard ship with migrants on board, and we have President uh, Emmanuel Macron urging to stop the suffering of the migrants. Uh, this is during a picture taken during a joint statement with the French um, Foreign Affairs Minister, with, of course, the International Organization for Migration and with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees Directors. Uh, I believe this was actually earlier this month. What does UNHCR say? So that's where we get to the numbers. They say that it's about 71 million 
individuals are forcibly displaced today. 41 million of which are actually internally displaced. 26 million almost are refugees, and about 3.5 million are asylum seekers. 80% of the refugees are being hosted in countries neighboring them. And 80% of these are actually being hosted in countries that are from lower to middle income countries who are suffering from a lot of the challenges that, uh, that these people are fleeing from, if you may. 57% of the UNHCR refugees come from these countries alone, Syria, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. And if we were to look at the top refugee hosting countries, we see that Turkey is at the top, Pakistan comes afterwards. You have, of course, Germany and other African countries. And that's where I talk about food insecurity. I kind of left it forward until now. Why am I talking about food insecurity? When we talk about conflicts and wars, we can't but talk about food insecurity, but food insecurity is not just the outcome of conflicts, as we all know. In terms of numbers, and again, just to um, bring this forward into the urgency of it, what we do know, and this is according to the State of Food Insecurity report that was published in 2019 based on the 2014 to 2018 data, we finally have a standardized measure to assess food insecurity globally, and we can look in the tracking and see how things are going. And they're not really going in the right direction. This is the prevalence of severe food insecurity. So if I were to actually highlight, that's severe food insecurity. So this is almost mimicking hunger, as we say. And if we were to look at the prevalence of moderate and severe food insecurity, and again, I know it's a busy slide, but just focusing on the numbers, it's about 26.4%. Which if I were to specifically focus on my region, where a lot of what I do and my work is involved in is in the Western Asia and Northern Africa, we're kind of hovering around the world average uh, prevalence of severe food insecurity and slightly higher than the prevalence of moderate and severe food insecurity. And these are in terms of numbers. We're reaching almost 2 billion individuals who are suffering from moderate or severe food insecurity. Almost uh, actually the same number of humans who are suffering from uh, micronutrient deficiencies, particularly iron, vitamin A, and zinc. So what does food security is? I know many of you probably know this, but just to kind of level the play field, it's a definition that we've agreed on from the time of the World Food Summit by the Food and Agriculture Organization, 1996. Food security is defined when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Quite a definition, I know, with a lot of things going on here. We like to partition it. As researchers or as academicians, we like to simplify things a little, and that makes sense. Well, it's based on main four pillars. The first pillar, is, it took us about a decade to kind of get out of it and think that maybe we should be thinking about also other things, which is good, which is definitely the first element, the food availability. And that's where, whether it's domestic production, the technologies that we have, the capacity to import, the food aid that's available. And the access is where a lot of the economists like to focus more on the income and the purchasing power. The transport and physical structure, market infrastructure is also very important in terms of the access dimension. And the utilization is very important because without which, even if food is available and even if it's accessible, we need to make sure that the body is capable of using the food and the nutrients to mobilize and digest and use. And this is where a lot of the nutritionists and public health professionals spend their time. And my bias is also there. A lot of what I do is actually in, at the intersection of access and utilization. And when we talk about utilization, we definitely talk about WASH, the water hygiene and sanitation programs that are taking place. We talk about food safety. We talk about infant, young child feeding practices, which are very critical in the first two years of a child's life. And we call them the 1,000 window of opportunity because it starts from pregnancy. And if we have adequate breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices, then you're giving the kids and the future generations a chance. And that by itself is a very core element of the food utilization aspect in food security. And finally, the pillar that without which none of these pillars can stand, and is really the stability. And this is where the macro level factors come in. So we're talking about economic uh, drivers, food price shocks. We're talking about political factors that lead to wars and crimes or um, you know, um, conflicts. We also, of course, talk about weather variability and seasonality that goes beyond sometimes and what we are facing in today's world with climate change and its impact. So, of course, we all are very familiar with the SDGs, and we also know that the SDGs are quite at the core of the SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, is food security. And many of us try to think about it as which one would be the best fit. Well, goal number two is definitely one of them, which is 
focused particularly on zero hunger and ending poverty and malnutrition. But as we were talking earlier about the SDGs being very connected, and there is, when it comes to food security, several goals that are very important to look into, whether ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all ages, goal number three, or the ensuring sustainable consumption and production. A lot of the work here is going around food waste and how we can cut that in order to improve food security. And of course, goal number 17 that we were referring to earlier, which is global partnership at the core of sustainable development. So we know that these goals are all very important and they're very much connected. And even with all this work and all the initiatives, we still continue to see climate change as one of the major threats of food insecurity globally. And it's threatening the world's food supply chain. Unfortunately, there is not a dearth of reports trying to urge us that we have to panic. And that's very truthful, coming even from the, the, the best advocacy groups. And they're also trying to tell us that the health impacts of the climate change is, is, uh, is very real, and that's why we need to call for action. A UN report that was published not long time ago also said it's a perfect storm. The degradation of the soil and land biodiversity, we have a growing human population, and we're literally wrapped in a blanket that's suffocating us. So it's a perfect storm. And we need to change people's diets to stop destroying land before it is too late. And unfortunately, just this morning, I was listening to the news and hearing about the Amazon fires, which are unprecedented in 20, com just comparing 2019 to 2018, is, has been quite an increase in those fires. And what does that mean and imply for us is still under question, but definitely our, our Earth is under a crisis. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but the Eat Lancet Commission is one of those ref reports that have been published earlier this year, actually in Oslo. And they were talking along the same lines, that changing diets is at the core of solving food insecurity. And civilization is in crisis, and we can no longer feed our population a healthy diet while balancing planetary resources. So they went on a mission for the last three years to work on finding what's the best food for the Anthropocene. I had to look up Anthropocene, by the way. <laughs> the food for the Anthropocene, basically what they're calling for is a great food transformation to be able to save our health, primarily, and then the, the health of the planet. So the Eat Lancet basically defined a reference diet that meets the nutritional requirements within planetary boundaries to minimize damage to Earth systems. And if I just want to orient you very briefly to this slide, again, not to look into specific numbers or anything, but if we were to look at this 100%, which is the intake recommended in the reference diet, and we look at food groups, we do see quickly that the red meat, the starchy vegetables, eggs, and poultry are surpassing the needs. And that's across the regions. As we go down into the list, we see that the fish consumption actually varies, the vegetables are below, fruits, whole grains, and definitely nuts, as well as legumes. So what are they calling for? They're calling for global adoption of the reference diet by 2050. Yet another global marker for us after 2030, another milestone that we should be working on, to reduce worldwide consumption of red meat, particularly, and meats in general, except for fish, and sugar to reduce it by 50% and to increase by 100% the consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and nuts. So that's not just me, the dietitian speaking here, the nutritionist, it's actually the Eat Lancet Commission saying that it's time to do something about this, otherwise we're really in crisis. A more recent, more recent conceptual framework that was actually published by Perez Isamilo, sorry for not putting that resource on the bottom, he was actually bringing together this um, concept again into the core of if you were to be implementing SDGs as governments and if we were to be actively working at these at all sectors, governmental, academic, and non-academic, we can reduce food insecurity. And by reducing food insecurity, we can, through several mechanisms, improve human health. And we are aiming to do that in order to also improve planetary health in the hope to, of course, continue reducing food insecurity, so kind of closing the loop. I know this is a conceptual framework, and there's much debate to be discussed on whether these patterns seem really smooth and easy, or it's much more complex than that. But frameworks are there to help us at least conceptualize what's the benefit and that intersection of the food insecurity with the sustainable development goals. But I'm going to bring back the story of food insecurity to the conflicts, because I've kind of deviated and talked about climate change and talked about what we're doing. 
there is definitely a recognition that food insecurity does lay at the intersection of conflict and migration. And actually, there is a kind of debate that continues to go on. And in the Middle East, that was quite a debate that was going on around the Arab Spring movement, or the Arab uprising, as other people like to call it. Whether food insecurity was the driver for the crises that happened, or is it the other way around, or is it the conflicts that caused food insecurity? And we can go in the discourse, and academicians, we love to have those discourses. In reality, this is a bidirectional. The start of the Tunisian crisis, the start of the Egyptian crisis, and the Syrian crisis were all actually starting from the fact that the food, the staple food, particularly bread, which we call in Arabic, laish, which is literally, it goes equal to livelihood, was getting to a price that was unaffordable. And that caused this trigger, if you may, in addition to other things regarding governance, poor governance, and corruption, and of course, lack of freedom. But definitely food insecurity was at the heart of it. And we know that the continuing domestic and regional instability in the region and the violence is what's actually stopping us from being able to get progress with sustainable development goals or with goal number two with food security. MENA region is really one of the most food insecure regions in the world, and I can have a lecture by itself about that, but that's not the point I'm here for. I am here to kind of showcase some of the story, but also some of the positives and what we can do about it. I know that Syrian crisis is happening, and this is actually the backdrop that we live on with a day-to-day -day basis. It caused massive migration. As I said, it has a, quite a toll on people's lives that should not be forgotten. When I look at the humanitarian Syrian crisis that have happened, it pushed about 5 million individuals out of the country, just to the neighboring countries that we were speaking about earlier, so between Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Libya, and Egypt, Egypt, not to mention those that were trying to flee to Europe and to the US and Canada. Syrian refugees in Lebanon alone, and that's where I bring the story back home, are almost a million at this point. At the start of the crisis, the registered refugees were more than a million and a half. And I focus on registered because these are registered Syrian refugees. This excludes those that don't register for many reasons because out of fear that they might actually be caught and sent back home to Syria where many of them were trying to flee the war to start with. It also excludes the Palestinian refugees, which have been in the country for about five decades. So this will bring me to the next slide, that Lebanon actually is considered, even though in numbers, in crude numbers, doesn't have large numbers like Turkey, for example, but it's the top in terms of refugee per capita concentration. And actually, you're not far from that. Sweden is among the countries in terms of population that is hosting a large number of refugees as well. The situation and challenges faced by Syrian refugees are plenty. Limited assets and resources are one of them, especially when you're into your 10th year of the crisis. Poor living, sanitary, and health conditions. This is not a picture that I have a hard time to find, unfortunately, because every, um, what we call usually camp, is like this in Lebanon. This is what we call informal tented settlements. We don't have refugee camps, the nice pictures that we see sometimes from Turkey and sometimes from Jordan on some of the camps, because they are legitimately camps. Whereas in my country, because the government has taken a stand on not um, considering that as a formal process of uh, integrating the refugees into the Lebanese um, society, we've actually turned into informal tent settlements. So anywhere across the country, refugees are displaced, but with definitely poor sanitary conditions, which is at the core of health, the, the challenges that, that they face. And of course, high disease burden. It started at the start of the crisis with infectious diseases, um, and then it escalated clearly and fastly into also the other chronic diseases that we're having difficulty in terms of access to services for, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cancers and other uh, cardiovascular diseases. Poverty and food insecurity are definitely on the rise, and there's several reports by the World Food Program showing the progress, even with the food assistance programs that are being offered, and they're plenty and they're generous. Unfortunately, food insecurity is still on the rise among the refugees. So why am I talking about this? Well, because one of the things that we had to reflect on as an institution at the American University of Beirut is that this is all happening in our backdrop, in our community. And we were asking ourselves at the beginning of the crisis, what can we do about it? Everyone was saying this is just a couple of months to a year. And then, of course, a year has passed and the second year has passed, and we were thinking, OK, now what? What are we going to be doing really about it? So there was really several attempts. The first things, of course, that I want to start with to tell you a little bit about my institution, because I haven't told you about AUB. And then I'll tell you how our vision 
has kind of weaved into it this whole issue to address some of the major challenges that are facing our region and the globe. Um, Beirut is at the heart of the Beirut, uh, the American University of Beirut is at the heart of Beirut and the Middle East. Uh, we consider ourselves one of the most beautiful universities in the, in the world. <laughs> That's our modesty. <laughs> I tend to testify that I definitely love our campus. Um, we have about 9,408 students and mostly our undergrad students, but of course we have about 1,626 graduate students. 22% uh, of our student population are international students, and we've been very lucky to actually have quite a diversity of students coming from not just North America and Europe, but also as the growing uh, scholarships are, um, are, uh, and endowments uh, have been uh, available for the university, we've been allowing, and it's been an opportunity for us to host more students coming from other um, African uh, countries, as well as Asian countries, as well as Middle Eastern and North African countries that couldn't uh, afford a private university, even though this is a private university, it's nonprofit, but nonetheless, we actually have quite a high cost for credit. So this, this has been really fortunate for us and for our classrooms. Recently, when we were celebrating the AUB's 150th anniversary, because we actually, um, we started in 1866, and it was a different name, it wasn't the American University of Beirut at the time, but we were revisiting the vision and mission statements, and we had a new president, President Fadlu Khouri here, who was basically looking into thinking about what he called vital, V standing for valuing our community and validating our values, so kind of looking back inward. I, innovating and integrating humanities, technology, and purpose-based education, T, transforming the university experience for all. A, advancing a world-class research agenda, especially in an area where we know that research funds are very limited. We need to continue to push that envelope. And L is lifting the quality of healthcare and medicine across our region. Along the same times, I'm going to jump into the Institute of Global Health that was actually launched in 2017. Due to the growing crises and the protracted conflicts that we are undergoing, including the Syrian crisis, the GHI came at a time, I think, that's pivotal, where it was not just a reaction, but finally a platform that can bring us people who are working on health issues together. And it is, of course, under the vision of the university, which they call the Health 2025, with a vision to establish a health sciences campus that can strategically and functionally align the health portfolios at AUB. The GHI, I think the first thing that I want to focus on is probably, I'm going to jump into the mission, two key words that we're thinking of is how to address global health challenges with a focus on context and sustainable impact. I look at context because what we were talking about in terms of internationalization at home that SLU and many institutions in Sweden are thinking of, we actually had to revisit that same thought and we kind of synchronized in some way or form because we were thinking a lot of the evidence that we're using in our interventions and in our programs that we do, whether with refugees or the Lebanese host community across sector in engineering and agriculture and nutrition and health are very based on other context and are very much based on evidence from North America, from Latin America, or from Africa and Asia. Not much from our region. So we need to think about what could be some of those interventions and programs that we can focus on here. And it's actually been quite growing fast and I've been fortunate to be a member of the GHI, particularly within the GHI program, Refugee Health Program, which I'll get to in a minute. The divisions are as follows. We have the research and policy kind of under the GHI programs. We have the capacity building, which is a GHI academy. And then we have what we call GHI Assist, which provides services, outreach activities, and support. And I actually won't have the chance today to go through each and every one of those programs, but I definitely encourage you, if you're interested, to first talk to me after the session and also visit our website, ghi.aub.edu.lb, because it can talk to each of those programs, kind of what's the start of it when it was established, but what we're doing. And I want to focus on Refugee Health Program because, again, I have my bias in there that I work with this program. But also we think of ourselves as, inter um, uh, there's a lot, if you want, of, of work amongst ourselves and very multidisciplinary teams as the Refugee Health Program focuses on refugee health-related matters. But the conflict medicine takes it, if you want, even a, a, more, a step forward and talks particularly about biological, physical, and psychological consequences of trauma. And a lot of the work that's being done now is in occupied territories of Palestine, in Iraq, in many countries where there's actually uh, ongoing trauma and conflict. And of course in Syria. The uh, GHI Academy has been doing a lot of work as well. I have to actually catch up with this program, with the programs and what they're doing. So kind of what you guys go through, through what is the institution doing? <laughs> We're playing catch up all the time. 
I'm trying to play catch up on, the, on that one as well. But there's a couple of things that are going on. We're getting really interesting partnerships with the Humanitarian, Humanitarian Leadership Academy to offer courses for either frontline practitioners who are interested in particularly work that is in trauma and in injuries. We have a center, sorry, this is the one that I was talking about, Center for Research and Education in the Ecology of War. There's another center for humanitarian advancement also with uh, public health professionals and humanitarians. And the Mobile University for Health, that's actually different from these two because it focuses on refugees and host communities and empowering them through what really it is a mobile university, a distance learning, and how can we ensure that they are equipped once Syria's war ends, so we're thinking about post-conflict Syria, and when in Lebanon, what can they do in order to enhance their own skills, giving them certificates and diplomas. The finally, GHI Assist here is also doing a couple of projects, uh, whether the NGO initiative, because we have more than a thousand initiatives in my country alone, and not really formal organized work. And we work a lot as academicians with this. So we need to think about how can we integrate our work with them and then assist the NGOs in kind of formally working together. And then we have the Global Health Youth Diplomas, the name stands for itself, and Sanadi, which really, it's an Arabic word, it stands for support in English. Uh, I think that's like the best translation for it. And it is providing, um, ref it's almost like adopting refugee camps. So instead of just doing sporadic visits, we actually take a camp for a couple of months. We do full assessment from medical, health, psychological, and it involves medical students. So this is a lot of involving of students that come from all over the region. So we've got students from not just Lebanon and also internationals, and they get the exposure. They get what it feels to be out of the UB campus, which by the way is an oasis. But if you stay there, you have no idea what's going on in the country. And just as soon as they step out, they learn that, one, they're benefiting the community, but also they're really learning. And that has changed. And I, I'm proud to say that I'm part of that team working on Senadi. It is shaping a lot of our future health workers. And um, uh, even engineers are involved in this, and medicine, and, and nutrition, and nursing, many students. I can't skip through what the faculty, my agriculture and food sciences faculty is doing, but our new dean, we also have a lot of new, <laughs> new president, new dean, new visions, new opportunities, have been very keen on promoting the idea of if we were to address a lot of the challenges that we're facing today in the region, whether it's water scarcity or the food insecurity that we're talking about, that we should take into consideration the water, excuse me, ooh, I kind of went a bit faster, the water, energy, food, health nexus, and he called this the Wifro initiative. And it takes into consideration not only food, but energy, water, and how can these all work together. And he's been actually very uh, keen on helping us address these questions through intercollaborations. And for the first time, there was this initiative that allowed us to actually work with people that are completely out of our comfort zone. So we've been given seed grants, kind of generous seed grants for, for the institution, to bring students and researchers from the uh, Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences to work with medicine, to work with engineering, to work with life sciences, and make sure that we're addressing these questions from different aspects. And, and to be very frank, no matter how much we say we're interdisciplinary, I kind of think with, alike with people who are in the health sciences, and maybe some of the food security and rural sociology people in my faculty, but I'm not gonna be, you know, I'm gonna be frank with you. I don't do water. <laughs> I don't know how to work on that. Uh, neither do I know how to work on soil degradation. So what he did is really kind of took us out of, you know, our comfort zone and put us in a room where he said, agriculture professors should be on every single research. At least one faculty member from our institution should be part of the project and let the best win. So we've got, had a couple of workshops. We've pitched in several ideas and, um, I'm on a team that actually got funded, so the seed funding, so we're very excited for that. But that's also along the lines of kind of thinking outside the box, because the problems are quite large. So then I'm going to kind of, okay, talked about my institution. Now I'm going to be very honest, even more honest. In the middle of all of this, I asked myself, because I joined AUB in 2013, and I was told, as soon as I joined, coming from a teaching institution before, that if you want to thrive in a research institution, focus. Think about your research portfolio. Think about your portfolio six, seven years from today, because countdown has just started. So basically, I started thinking, what can I do? Should I do anything? I mean, everything that's going on in this region is, is an opportunity. And I am actually here. I don't know how many of you are in this particular track. <laughs> 
I found that this is actually a funny but very truthful comic because I am the assistant professor, junior faculty member who's thinking I should research whatever publishes good in impact factor journals, but also fast because I don't have much time to waste. I can't really fantasize about what my research is. I have to do that when I'm either a tenured or an emeritus professor. So I had to be very strategic and I had good team to help me plow through this. But the kind of questions that I ask myself, and I hope this is of any value, of added value for some of you who are kind of struggling along with many of the institutional platforms, initiatives, policies, is how can I do this? Because I also have my own list of other things to do, right? So I started thinking, what can I do best? So I'm a researcher. First thing I want to do is produce research evidence. So that's something that everybody will clap for. But also, that could be beneficial for the topic at hand. And because I'm fortunate that I work in a community nutrition setting, I actually thought the first thing I want to do is I want to assess the prevalence in correlates of food insecurity. Because I realized very fast as I was doing literature that Lebanon doesn't have much, and definitely before even the Syrian crisis. So I went through that kind of research area, explored the relationship between food insecurity, dietary intake, and diet quality, develop evidence-based interventions, and test their effectiveness. I kind of put together, and of course it looks really nice and clean. I wasn't that focused from the beginning. I had to kind of also go through the questions a little uh, in an iterative process. The second thing is, okay, I'm a teacher, and because I work with students, they're the best platform to work with. They need those kind of experiences in the community, and the community needs them. So why can't I use my courses, my internship opportunities, because I'm a coordinator for the, um, the nutrition and dietetics program for their internships? Why can't I use that in order to bridge between what the students need and what the communities do need? And of course, being involved in conferences and workshops definitely is very important to disseminate the knowledge and the evidence that we're producing so that it's not kept in that beautiful impact fact journal that honestly only 10 to 15 people may read. And if I'm really lucky, I reach up to the 100 people. So I need to kind of expand a little. The community mobilization and service was also along the lines of allowing students to be given the opportunity to be volunteers, community-based learning opportunities, and provide services where and if needed. And this is where I do a lot of partnership with the GHI and with other, um, uh, the Center for Community Service and Learning also in our institution. And finally, I thought, okay, if I can, through all these, advocate for policy level changes, then that's great. Um, I think that's definitely a role that each one of us will go for. I haven't been as successful here I think I've been given some opportunities. At one time I was visiting the parliament because of a discussion and dialogue about refugees, so that was a good opportunity to kind of ask questions and get enlightened about what some of the politicians' dialogue and discourse is and try to provide some facts, so that's good. But if we can't do this on a day-to-day -day basis, that's okay. We can do so much and we will do what we can. Uh, this is just a quick synopsis. By no means oh, anybody's going to read those articles. I know we're we don't have the time, but I just wanted to say that the work really started with a study in Greater Beirut, and when the evidence was showing that there's really something to talk about, food insecurity is happening even in an urban setting in the country, I went for what is the first national study investigating household food insecurity with households with children. Um, so I was very happy to actually publish this work, finding about 50% of the Lebanese households with children across the country are uh, food insecure is something, and finding that about 64% of the refugees of the sorry Lebanese host communities in north of Lebanon are food insecure is something. I want to just put this in perspective. When I was asking these questions and asking for funding, the, the there was a wave of people looking at me and thinking, but the refugees is the story. So what are you talking about? Why are you researching the Lebanese? And I wanted to say just, it wasn't um, necessarily fully planned, some of it's serendipity, but I thought there's a story that is being told that the Lebanese are suffering from, from, from the presence of the refugees, that discourse that, you know, they're a burden. So I wanted to say, okay, well, I don't even have the evidence for that, so let's look for it, you know? So that was the first project. Not to belittle the amount or the importance of the refugee crisis, because I actually was and continuously and in parallel working in other projects with our students uh, who really, I'm very proud of published this work in Good Impact Factor Journals in the nutrition health field. So we looked at a, a project that's very dear to my heart. We've tested the, um, a, a pilot school-based intervention in an informal school, informal school setting uh, in the Bika, the east of the country. And we looked at the impact of the nutrition education complemented by healthy, nutritious snacks on the knowledge, attitude, and behavior, as well as dietary intake and nutritional status. 
Um, we also, in parallel, we're looking at another model that's very um, popular, the community kitchens that are actually across the country for, um, bringing women from the refugee settings and the host community to cook together and then provide those hot meals to the families. And how does that uh, impact food insecurity? So that was another work that we've done, and we found that it's truthful, that actually it was positive, those community kitchens. And this is the first study that kind of brings the community kitchen conversation into the MENA region, because a lot of the literature has been more in other contexts. This is the Gata project that I was talking about. These are the informal schools. I say informal because they're adjacent to informal camps or the informal tented settlements. We're not allowed to have formal schools except integrating the refugees into the public school system, which it is and it's happening, but not all children are capable of going there for transportation reasons, for safety reasons. So this was an intervention that was actually just a walking distance from those informal camps. And it's, it's, it's the nice thing about it, and it actually won a couple of awards because the Faculty um, of Engineering and Architecture brought this model, which is a student project, that turned into a really successful example of how you can build schools in two days, and you can actually pack them and carry them with you to wherever you want. That's really cool. <laughs> That's when you know that the something that one, the government wasn't hesitant about, because we can discuss why the Lebanese government is having that, that stand with the refugees and the integration to the society or not. But also, it's very helpful for the Lebanese community around them to feel like this is, this is not going to be permanent, like the Palestinian refugee issue, and for the Syrians to feel like they're actually going to gain not just education now, but they can actually take these schools even wherever they go, even if they move within the country. I'm going to skip through these slides. These are beautiful pictures of our students who are actually having those healthy meals and snacks. And I'm going to say that we've been actually working on a couple of other projects some mixed methods, qualitative, some are quantitative. I've, I've been more and more interested in exploring the perceptions and experiences of the refugees, so going beyond numbers and really hearing the stories, of, as you may. A more recent project that I haven't had the chance to dig much into the analyses, but I was fortunate to get access to the Gallup World Poll Food and Agriculture Organization Voices of Hunger project. That project that's basically bringing the household food insecurity across the 140 countries accessible to the researchers. So we are going to be exploring this data set, and I'm very much interested in exploring the determinants and differentials of food insecurity among migrants and nationals, focusing on the MENA region and comparative studies there, as well as within Europe, and looking at countries that have open integrative policies versus those that have more of a shut policy or a shut door policy, and how is that affecting food insecurity for the nationals and for the migrants and refugees. Um, we've been trying to keep busy with disseminating, as I said, the knowledge. We've been trying to keep busy in terms of providing our students with capacity, with capacity building and workshops and hands-on courses. Um, these are a couple of the events that our students have been involved in, including celebrating Refugee Health Days, which happens on, in June 2018, and we celebrated it in June 2019 with the launch of the Sanadi project that I talked about. Um, these are other projects we were looking at infant young child feeding practices and working with women from the, from the local um, communities and with the refugees. And finally, I want to stop with just one. So this is literally the slide before the acknowledgement, so bear with me. <laughs> um, this is kind of a new venture. And for those of us who, this is kind of me plugging Alex if people want to come to our session afterwards to learn more about the process behind this course. This is um, a research collaboration that turned into nothing of a research collaboration. It actually pivoted and became an educational uh, partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, as well as with UC Berkeley. And I'm very happy to be part of that team because what we've done is actually kind of attempted to go for a MOOC. We called it MOOC at first, but then we decided to call it online refugee health course. Um, believe it or not, actually, there aren't much courses, formal courses for credit or even for, uh, you know, um, as a formal education, if you may, on refugee health in the Middle East. So what we did is we actually developed a course with its learning outcomes and objectives in order to focus on that. So it's a three university partnership that got the funding from Aspen Institute. And we've actually did this in the fall of, well, this is the announcement for fall semester, but we've also done the first version in the spring. And we've had some lessons learned there, so I'm very happy to share some of those, uh, if not in the Q&A, of course, in the parallel session with my colleagues. Um, I want to thank everyone that I've worked with, whether it's from the Refugee Health Program with Dr. Fuad Fuad, Muna Asman, or Noor, or the growing team. 
The acknowledgments of every single person that I've worked with, many of whom are actually AUB faculty members, nutrition department, and then we have School of Nursing. I work with the agriculture researchers, agri the architecture guy who got that award-winning um, platform for the Gata project, that's the guy, and Juliana, who's really um, an excellent researcher and qualitative researcher, and Fatima Karaki from UCSF, who's given me the opportunity to also expand our collaboration and give our students the opportunity, a virtual exchange between three universities and undergrad and senior undergrad and graduate students to talk uh, across different disciplines. Um, and finally, thank you. Shukran.